Welcome to Transparent with Tina. I am Tina Marks, your host. Today's guest is an entrepreneur through and through. He was named top entrepreneur in America under 35 in 2013, top 40 under 40 in 2019 by the Business Journal. Ernest and Young had named him Entrepreneur of the Year in 2020. He was recruited by Forbes to be an entrepreneurship instructor at their Forbes School of Business and Technology. LinkedIn recruited him to create courses in entrepreneurship for the LinkedIn Learning Center. He is CEO and founder of Everable, and he has a book coming out and a podcast. Up next, Jeff Fenster. Welcome, Jeff. I'm so happy to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. It's a true honor and pleasure and a privilege. So thank you very much. Thank Big you. Big fan of your show. Well, you are fascinating. And I, I don't even know how old you are. I know that. How old are you? Let's start with that. I'm 37. 37. Okay. So you started a, a while ago. Let's start with the yes. backstory. Okay. So you started in 2016. Uh, with Everbowl? Well, yes. not yet. Yeah. No, before Everbowl. So you started 2016 in Everbowl, right? Correct. Yeah. So prior to um, that, you were going into law, right? So I graduated, I went to law school in 2004 and graduated in 2007 um, okay. and was going to be a sports agent. And that was my career path of choice. And I graduated with the full intention of doing that and had a job lined up. Um, but my fian I had a fiance and a little daughter and ultimately decided being a sports agent was going to require me to travel too much and not be around. And um, I really wanted to raise my own child and be home more and not be at the beck and call of uh, professional athletes traveling around. So um, didn't, yeah, so I just, I, I changed careers after I got the, the degree and uh, finished the schooling and luckily had six figures in law school loans to remind me about that every day. And um, <laughs> motivator. So path. Yeah, yeah, a little motivator. Exactly. Yeah. So, at, so you went from there into working for a payroll company. Is that right? Yeah. So, I mean, I graduated and I wasn't really sure what I was going to do with my life. Uh, a friend of mine was working at a company, ADP, selling payroll services. And I had always been pretty good in sales. And she said, well, why are you figuring it out? I want to get a sales job. Come work for us. Uh, we're hiring. And so I did. I, I got a job there to sell payroll just to figure things out um, and start obviously paying off law school loans and support my fiance and daughter. And had really no inclination about entrepreneurship or even a thought about wanting to be an entrepreneur. Um, I figured I'd be a sales rep and figure out like, you know, pharmaceutical company or medical device or high end cars or something that I could make some money and, and um, sell. But I was really successful at ADP and was the number one sales rep in the country. My first six months there made a boatload of money, um, a lot of recognition, built a big ego and a big head. And, uh, well, you know, it's funny you said that because I saw you on another interview and you were saying because you because you were number one, you, you were um, owed a bonus. Right. And then they wanted to right. wait. What was it? Six or eight months to give you the bonus. Yeah. So when I signed my contract, they're on a fiscal year. And so it's uh, July 1st through June 30th is their fiscal year. And when I signed my contract for the year, it was like, look, these are your goals. And if, and if you hit this certain threshold in sales, you get a bonus, a $17,000 pay increase bonus. and um, I did it in January and they told me I had to wait until the end of June when the year ended and I would get it in July because these are annual goals and they're built for an annual year system. Um, and although I made it early and was, you know, very quick to do it, they would just weren't, weren't in a position to give it to me. And I really took offense to that. I, I didn't understand how a company who told me to go sell a lot of stuff. Uh, when I did that and I achieved all the metrics and goals that they wanted, and I was the first to make presence club and I was making all of these awards and, and showing my value, why they couldn't figure out how to give me $17,000 when they're a, you know, multi, many, many times over billion dollar brand and company and global icon in the space. And so it's not um, that they didn't have it. They just wanted to, to make you wait for, for some reason. Well, uh, truthfully now, I mean, back then I felt like it was personal. Now I understand that they're just so big and there's so many layers to the company that nobody was in a position to approve it and no one really knew how to do it. And it got a few levels higher than a basic outside sales rep and everyone lost interest in giving a shit about whether or not I got it or not. So I didn't have the ear of the right person and 
no one could help me and no one really wanted to invest the political capital inside their own organization to fight for it. And, you know, I was only there six months. So I was also this new guy that, that they heard about maybe some of my, my results, but that was it. And so I, I said, basically I threatened to quit in a disagreement with my manager. I said, well, if they're not going to give it to me, then I'm not valued here. So I'm going to quit. And I thought that was going to be enough. I went home and I'm like, well, I said this, but they're going to give it to me tomorrow. And I would have bet everything I had at the time that I was getting a $17,000 check the next day. Not sure so enough, much. I, <laughs> no, I came, in, I, I came in and they were like, I'm sorry, Jeff, like realistically, if you want to quit, I mean, there's nothing we can do to keep you here. We want you here, but uh, this is an annual goal and we're not going to create a new system and process for you. Uh, you have to understand this is how things are done here. And um, so, you know, just know that it's going to be yours and get back to work. And I went home that day so like deflated. Like I just saw, I had the, my career life flash before my eyes of this constant need to be waiting for some arbitrary date. And I'm going to trade time for progress. And it's not merit-based, which I prefer because if I fail on my own, great. And if I succeed on my own, great, but at least I control my destiny. And uh, I just, I, I felt like I was just suffocating immediately. And, um, I went home and I called my, my, well, I spoke to my fiance and I, she was supportive. I was like, I want to quit and start my own payroll company. I know how to sell this. I just sold all these clients. I'm sure some of them will come to me and I'll figure it out. And she was supportive. And then I called my mom and dad and I said, listen, um, I'd like to sell my house, move in with you guys, with my daughter and fiance and start a company. And they were like, you don't know anything about starting a company. And what are you, what are you doing? You're, you're making a great living. Like, don't be stupid. Everybody thought you were Come crazy. On. Everybody probably thought Everyone, you were crazy. Yes. Yeah. yeah. My, my, well, my, I've, my I've been in that especially. situation too. Yeah. You know, yeah. But, but what's so interesting about that, because you said, you know, I was cocky. I'm saying cocky, confidence. I mean, that was definitely a defining moment in your life. You know, whether you realized it or not, at that moment, you realized that you were an entrepreneur. Because at that yeah, moment, not, you said, I'm not answering to anybody. But even more so than that, that was your first like real job, right? Correct. To walk yeah. away from that money, um, there, there was like no fear there. There was obviously such a knowing. Where do you think that knowing came from? Do you think it was like internally? Do you think that was rationally? Or do you think that, because I believe we all have like an internal teacher. I, I believe we all have the answers inside of us. You mm -hmm. know, as long as we pay attention and we're in touch and, you know, whether it's your intuition, whatever you want to call it. I mean, what was calling you there? Was it more your, your head calling you? Was it more your intuition or what was it? I mean, I, I think, you know, it's, it's hard because it was so long ago and I didn't spend the time to reflect, but I think it was a combination of a few uh, things. I think primarily because I wasn't meant to be in payroll, like I, it was more of a, I took this job on a whim. I didn't really value the job. And while I was extremely successful um, there, I believed I was successful based on my sales skills and not the fact that I was selling ADP's products. So mm -hmm. um, I had a little bit of confidence that worst case, I could go to their biggest competitor paychecks and say, look at what I did. I'll, they'd give me a job. Um, and knowing that I've always had a track record in sales and having worked in sales in high school and college and uh, even during law school and in little side jobs and internships and everything was always around sales. I was pretty confident I could always get a sales job. Yeah. So I kind of had like the security of, you know what? I mean, granted, I picked a weird time. I had literally, we had just bought a house. So we've been in the house maybe three months. Um, yeah, that in itself, seriously. I mean, most people don't do that. <laughs> correct. That's right? the, well, that's the, it, it's the, it's the perfect excuse not to. It's because I have this mortgage. Exactly. And, I have exactly. This kid and, and people do it for far smaller excuses. Than <laughs> I mean, you had a, a child yeah. and you just bought a house and everything. And then, so then now, you're not going to work for somebody else. You're going to open up your own company. I mean, where did you get the money? Oh, you got, did you get that from the sale of your house? I did. Hey, okay. well, that and I got, and because I quit, they had to give me the 17,000 um, bucks. Okay. So you, you, they had to pay me out. So I got, you know, all of my commissions and I got the 17,000 and I, I sold my house, which I actually lost money on because I didn't have enough equity. And now I had to pay closing costs and realtor fees. And um, so most of it was a wash. But um, when I moved in with my mom and dad, um, my parents actually were the first investor in my first company, iChex. They, they invested $20,000 and showed their support. I mean, the, the, the beauty, the thing I had, which I guess not everyone does, is I had an incredible support group between my fiance totally. um, and, and my parents to let us. I mean, not a lot of parents would let 
their child who is engaged with a little baby and has a good job and a house just yeah. give that all up to chase this thing and come on in. Right. Um, but I, I'm blessed and fortunate that I do. And I think, I think a combination of all of that, knowing that, you know what, I mean, if I failed and if I'm going to do it, I had to do it now. Mm -hmm. And I just, I just felt like I had to do it. And I guess when I, when I talk to people who ask me the question, it's a self, it's a personal thing, but it's what's worth more to you, the house or your happiness. And the house to me, it, it wasn't just like the job. It wasn't my dream house. It wasn't like I had the most, you know, it, it's a starter house and it was my first home and it wasn't like anything out of this world, but it was mine. And I felt amazing to have to be able to be in a position to purchase a home. Right. Um, but I never wanted to be, I, I also had a little daughter and I, and I didn't want her to ever see me as the person who didn't pursue my dreams because of some excuse or reason like i wasn't happy and i knew I if i'm not happy i wasn't going to be a good husband i wasn't going to be a good friend i wasn't going to be a good father i wasn't going to be all the things i wanted to be and yeah. so i just i had to do it absolutely i love this i, I mean you, you basically bet on yourself and you know there's so many people I and mean, this is one of the reasons i do the show i mean i always inter you know everybody they interview is an entrepreneur they share their story um because i think that my I don't know what the percentage is, maybe 90% of the people out there are working at a job that they can't stand. And you know, their quality of life is in the toilet, uh, physically, mentally, spiritually, for those reasons. And why? Because they don't believe in themselves enough and they don't have a support system like, like, like you just mentioned, you know? And so, you know, by hearing your story, hopefully it will help other people. So let's, so you went and you did get back into payroll. You became successful. And I know you went on to do, to uh, create other companies and become very yep. successful, but you also had some failures too along the way. Of course. Right? Can of you course. tell us a story of your biggest failure? I mean, I don't really believe in failures as long as you learn from them, but what was your, your biggest train wreck of a, a company? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, it's funny is it's a failure because it didn't achieve financial success. It didn't work. Um, and it's a mistake a lot of aspiring and, and new entrepreneurs make. And I made it. And uh, it was I sold my payroll company and I sold a recruiting agency that I had started. And um, one of the things that I had realized as, an, as I realized that more than payroll or recruiting or anything is I'm a serial entrepreneur, which means I like to start companies and build them, scale them, and then exit and do another company. Mm -hmm. um, one of the challenges was get, raising capital and, and getting access to funding because, you know, I had to bootstrap couple businesses and it was hard and I did eventually raise some private equity capital, but it's a challenging time for entrepreneurs. And at the time, uh, the concept of equity based crowdfunding was illegal. And what that essentially means is um, you had to be an accredited investor to invest in a company. For me to solicit an investment, you either had to be an accredited investor, which meant a, a certain high net worth, or I had to have a personal relationship with you. However, this whole, you know, uh, crowdfunding concept which is very prevalent today you know in charities with um gofundme and kickstarter yeah. and all that this wasn't really there yet so this was at the very beginning of this and equity-based crowdfunding or the idea that i could get a hundred dollars from a thousand people to raise a hundred thousand dollars for equity was illegal you weren't allowed to do it and it was an old 1930s law and i wanted to change that i wanted to legalize equity-based crowdfunding because the rationale behind the illegality of it was gone. And the idea then, you know, in the thirties was they didn't want, you know, used car salesmen basically convincing individuals that were unsophisticated in the, in the business world to give their life savings or, or savings into these businesses. They needed some regulation, but in 20, you know, this was 2012 or 2011, 2012, um, we have the internet and information is abundant and people are more sophisticated and have access to information and um, micro investments from a larger group of people is an easier way for, for a lot of entrepreneurs to get the funding because it's a lot harder to find someone to give you a hundred thousand dollars than it is to find a thousand people to give you a hundred dollars. And so I wanted to create a platform that I could put my concept out there or other than any entrepreneur could, and they could showcase their company and what they stand for and give out equity for these little micro investments, $5, $10, $50, $100, and pool the capital they needed in large, in large amounts by you know, attracting a lot of people at the same time, giving people who don't have a lot of money opportunity to invest in these companies of tomorrow and hopefully make money along the journey. Perfect. And exactly. And so uh, I started a company called Equity Circle and the whole concept was that. And it was a great concept. 
And then we started a change.org petition to help legalize it. And we got hundreds of thousands of signatures. And I invested so much energy, money, and time into the legalization side that once it became legal and we were successful, uh, I didn't spend enough time on my platform. And I lost out to a bunch of other entrepreneurs that had the platform and were waiting for oh. someone like me to help legalize it. Okay. So, so that's where the GoFundMe's, the Kickstarters, and there's now a whole bunch of equity-based platforms out there that you can go to. Um, they won and I lost. And so I spent, a, you know, I, I lost six figures on the technology and my time and, and money. And you it was a personally failure lost of a company. You, you yeah. personally lost. Okay. Uh, yep. You know, that was another question I was going to ask. Would you suggest that an entrepreneur spend his own money? You know, I had, yes. you, you would, you know, it's interesting because I, I have a friend of mine who's actually, you know, not, not even a millionaire, he's a billionaire. And he said, you know, I wouldn't invest in anybody that hadn't already spent their own money first. Because I too. guess that doesn't yeah. matter. Well, because at the end of the day, right, when you use OPM or other people's money, um, it's fine, it's great. But if you're using it as your starting gate, you're not fully committed. Uh, you know, I'm an investor now. And if I invest in someone and like my payroll company, I raised, you know, we raised millions of dollars over the years for my payroll company. Yes. But anyone who wanted to ask me, what did I have? What skin did I have? I sold my house. I moved in with my parents. I put right. every penny I had into this business and took money from my parents, which meant if it was tough and the going was really tough and, and quitting is the easier option, I'm not right. going to for all these reasons. I have all these reasons that my, my intimate circle is going to have to feel it. And so therefore that is going to keep me going. And so you know I'm giving 100% of what I Absolutely. have. And I want to make sure that in, entrepreneurs are doing the same. Well, you know, and it also keeps, yeah, you accountable. And it brings up two things here. You know, I, you talk, in, I watched a couple of interviews with you. You talk about your whys. And I talk about my whys with my clients all the time. You have to have a why. Why do you want to make this amount of money? You know, and the more specific you are, it's basically setting goals for yourself. Um, and also you had mentioned, which I write about in my first book, is that I, I, I the way I word it is, um, I'm thinking how I saw that you worded it. Uh, let's see. You don't have a backup plan. I write my book. I don't have a plan B. Because I write, if you have a plan B, you don't believe in your plan A enough. Is, is that exactly how you feel? Yep. It's the old burn the boats uh, mentality, which is you, you're going to take the beach. You burn the boat. Because you're right. There, there's so many, anyone who hasn't done it, um, there's so many tough times along the journey, right? And so there's so many opportunities to give up. And if it's too nice of a, if giving up seems too good because your backup plan is like, you can sell it as like, oh, I still have this as an option. Mm -hmm. Then you won't persevere through those tough times that are meant to test you. Right. And get, once you get through it, you have exponential growth. Um, having been there and done that. And I mean, I started my first company in 2008, the beginning of the financial crisis. Mm -hmm. And um, we're dealing with another one now. And yeah, a different kind of pandemic, yeah. right? And yeah, I'm we're going to get to that space, in a minute. So, yeah, right. I want to so, talk to you about that. Yeah, how that's yeah, it happens. Uh huh. It happens. And, right. And if you spend but you time either on have the attitude plan, like, a, "What do I have to do to find the solution?" Instead of focus, don't focus on the problem. Focus on the solution. I think so many people. It's so easy, um, you know, to say, you know, because I coach real estate agents, mm -hmm. and um, well, nothing, you know, n nobody's buying right now. It's like, well. Why are a lot of my clients kicking ass? It's all up here, right? It's all really what you tell yourself. Do you have any, so let me make this very clear for everybody that's listening, okay? So if you want to really be successful, you have to have a, a very strong why or whys, children, this, that, and then you also have to be 150% committed. You know, no plan. Well, if this doesn't work, I'll do that. It's it's like kind of like getting married and going, if it doesn't work, I'll get a divorce. I mean, like how committed are you, right? If somebody's, I mean, right. who wants to marry somebody like that? So um, uh, where was I going with this? Let's see. Um, okay, so let's get right into your current business because we, we were talking about the pandemic. Okay, so you own Everbowl, which is right. a uh, healthy, I, I love the sounds of it. You have 21 locations in Southern California, right? Uh, 20, 28. Oh, well, the internet's wrong then. You better update that. <laughs> it's okay. It's a good wrong. 20, okay, 28. All right, fantastic. So there are a lot of these ingredients, I want to go here for a specific reason. Okay, so you have, I'm, there's two that I haven't heard of. So a lot of the bases are the acai, the pedahaya, 
it, I, I'm probably pronouncing this wrong, but you guys know what I'm talking about. The, the dragon fruit, the gra, graviola and the acerola. Now I have not yes. heard of those two. Now why, 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 not, why is this like not many people know of these two? Cause I was reading up on them. They're anti-inflammatory, anti-cancerous. I mean, the other one, it has a lot of multifunctions, like if you're low in vitamin C and this and that. Are they like the same kind of consistency as the bowls for like the acai? Mm -hmm. It is. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Same, same consistency. We make them very similarly. Uh, they provide a different flavor profile and a different set of uh, health benefits. Okay. Uh, the graviola is being researched extensively here in the United States. Um, you know, some some major uh, universities are doing these things where they took the 12 most common cancers in 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 the United States and they gave a certain test group uh, chemotherapy and graviola extract and a certain test group just chemotherapy and found that the group that got chemotherapy and graviola had less symptoms, uh, had better recession rates. And, and so now they're trying to figure out how to turn it into a pharmaceutical drug. Um, right. And then acerola is the highest content of vitamin C on the planet. And uh, human beings are one of the only mammals that don't produce our own vitamin C. And I'm a bit of a you know, when I do something, I'm, I'm all in and I'm really big into the health and wellness state, space. And, and I believe it's easier to prevent illness than cure illness. And I think too often in, in America with Western society, we're so focused on curing, curing, curing. And I want to prevent, prevent, prevent. Right. And when you look at what, you know, heart disease, stroke, obesity, cancer, 80% um, of these are lifestyle driven, which means that we can prevent 80% of them if we move our bodies and eat right. And so my why unevolved which is a word I created and trademarked to live actively and eat stuff that's been around forever is predicated on realizing that we use technology in so many great ways for, for society, for business, for life, but it's bad for health. We no longer move our bodies as much. And now we're eating laboratory created food, which our body doesn't know what to do with. So it's Absolutely. foreign. So if we just go back to moving our bodies and living actively and eat stuff that's been around forever, we're going to be our best self. And so Everbowl is tagline is made from stuff that's been around forever. So that's the eating side of the unevolved lifestyle. And I'm trying to create a restaurant chain that is um, makes eating healthy, affordable, filling, available and delicious. And um, so more people eat it because, uh, you know, I, to have a business, you know, I like to jump into new industries with zero experience as a serial entrepreneur. I was going to ask you that too. Yeah. Hold that thought. Okay. Just hold that thought because I have a question around that. I just want to finish up here. The only yeah. thing I want to say is, you know, it can get really confusing because everything you said, I believe is as Bible, but I just had mm -hmm. Dr. Gundry on. Do you know who Dr. Stephen Gundry is? Okay, I the do. plant paradox. And he's saying fruits, if they have seeds, and if they're not picked when they're in season, they actually are harmful to you. I just had Dave Asprey, Bulletproof Coffee. He's telling me that raw spinach and raw kale are not good for you. I, I, I'm in them, I swear, I'm in the market the other day. I'm paranoid now, I'm going, can't mm -hmm. have that can't have that. And he says, if you cook the spinach and I said, well, Dave, I heard that that takes all the nutrients out of it. So, you know, it's like what to believe at this point, because, you know, like, like I said, Dr. Gundry would say probably, um, you know, these fruits because they do have seeds and, you know, it's the plant trying to protect itself. I mean, where, where do you stop? I mean, where do you, uh, uh, well, this is a personal wanna, question for me. I'm just trying to yeah. figure this out. Right. I, I'm going to answer it the way I answer. I don't pick on anyone's beliefs. You know, people can, there's doctors, there's individuals that will come out. Um, I'm going to say this. You have to eat every day. If you have to make a choice between a Twinkie, a Big Mac, right. or a spinach salad, yeah. choose the spinach salad. You're yeah. still better off. Okay. Even if it's not as good for you as maybe because uh, you didn't cook it. It's not bad for you. Right. Um, I can promise you there's vegans and vegetarians and carnivores and paleo diets and Atkins diets. And, you know, there's a million. Well, that's the other thing he was saying. He said, uh, Dave said, vegan is like the worst thing you, you could. That's why I'm like, my head's just, okay. Yeah. Let's, let's but, get off. I'm not, a, I'm not a doctor. All I'll say is start with eating stuff. That's been real whole food. Whether it's an animal. Exactly. Yeah. Whether it's whole an food. animal or it's a plant. Whatever your belief, whatever your convictions are, your body still knows how to process that spinach, that watermelon, that that apple, that cherry, that kale. Your right. body does not have inflammation occur. And I think we can all agree on that. Whether or not it's right. as good for you as some pundits might say, I'm not here to sell you. I don't have a company that sells any of those products directly, individually like that. Right. Um, so you're not invested I'm, I'm in saying, that way. Yeah. No. Yeah. Just well, eat, exactly. eat real food. I heard, you know, it's like your body looks at it and says, well, I don't know what to do with this. So let's put it over here. And that's why it's stored as fat. 
But if it recognizes it, it can use it and convert it into, into fuel, it uses it, then you don't get fat. And that's where- and, and, I, and I would challenge anyone, if someone just ate spinach all day, I guarantee you they won't be fat. No, they're not gonna be fat, exactly. And that's- They won't. That's, okay. <laughs> So you were saying, here we're going to go. So you were saying you jump from industry to in industry with zero experience, and then you believe experience is most overrated prerequisite for starting a company. So tell us about yes. that. Well, uh, it's a common thing. You know, I speak to a lot of aspiring and current entrepreneurs or people who want to start companies, and they always say, well, Jeff, I just need more experience. Or, you know, how did you start this? You have no experience. And experience is so overrated because um, I can teach you in a book how to swim, but until you get in the pool and actually start to swim and feel what it feels like to be in the pool, you're never going to learn how to swim. And the same is true about starting a company. I mean, when I started Everbowl, you know, I, I told, was telling my mom and dad, and my dad's a contrarian by nature and I love him, but he's just, he sees the glasses half empty and is always looks at all the things that can go wrong. And yeah. he's like, Jeff, nine, nine out of 10 restaurants fail. What are you doing? Like, you don't know anything about it. You should meet my sister. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. You know, and, yeah. and my mom was like, Jeff, you don't know how to cook. Uh, all you do in the kitchen is eat and make a mess. And um, she's right. But let's think about that now. Let's peel that back. Nine out of 10 restaurants fail, but 10 out of 10 restaurants are started by people with restaurant experience. So 90% of them are still failing. What is the experience going to do for me, but give me a 10% success rate? Why does that matter? What I know is all businesses, whether it's a restaurant, a payroll company, real estate, uh, pharmaceutical company, they still have the same core foundational business principles of you need to make more money than you spend. You need to have a good P&L. You need to make the right investments in culture and people in your why. If you're a service or a product, you have to be able to attract customers and make sure that they, they see value in what you're doing. And if you can build the right brand and the right company, regardless of industry, it works. Right. And so I'm a business guy. I'm an entrepreneur. So I can attract and bring the right people in who have the expertise in the areas I don't and fill my gaps. Cause I don't have an ego with it. I want to be the dumbest guy in the room and surround myself with amazing people and leverage the fact that they're experts in what they do. And I'm an expert in what I do. And together we build a dream team and we'll be successful. And so experience to me is overrated. And anyone who's sitting on the sideline waiting for this arbitrary experience, um, stop waiting, just jump in and you will, you will learn and develop the skills necessary. And I call it just in time learning. Um, and you'll learn what you need to learn just in time. I mean, Things happen. Like when I started a restaurant, I had no idea what I needed. Then I hired a consultant for five grand to say, what do I need to open a restaurant? Oh, you need a health department. Okay. So I went to the health department. Okay. They said I needed a, a business license and a sales license. Great. I just in time learned that. Now I'm yes. going to go get those things. And I follow the blueprint one step in front of the other. And then the restaurant's open. And okay. here we go. Well, and you were saying that too, which I think is one of the reasons you're very successful too, is that you know what? You hire, you delegate to the people that know it. You don't try and learn it. You know, you, if you trust them, it's like, let them run with it. Don't try to be, you know, the master of all trades. Exactly. Correct. And that's what, that's what and don't, and don't have the ego with it. Right. Cause I Thank used to, you. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. I used to, and I learned from it. And, and the key thing there is not to just trust anybody. Um, what I try to hire for is your why. If our whys are aligned and our goals are aligned into what we're working towards, that's I might not agree with how you want to get there. I might not understand how you want to get there. But if I know where there is, and that's the same place I'm going, yeah. uh, and I and I think you have the dedication, the passion, and the right intangibles, let's go together. And I trust that you're going to carry your side, and I'm going to carry my side, and we're going to get there. It's where, where where partnerships and employees and employers get disarray and dysfunction is they don't focus on making sure that we're all trying to get to the same endpoint. Right. Um, there's a, there's they, more they of a hierarchy. What your skills are. Yes. Yeah. So there's either the focus, ego, either the ego gets involved, right? Or the fact that a lot of people can't delegate because they don't, you use the word trust, right? So that's a control issue. So what happens though? So, so when I feel like, because I believe in energy, the universal laws, you know, what happens when you're trying to control things is you're actually cutting off the energy to yourself and your business. Do you're you're attracting, unfortunately, yeah, I agree hundred percent. You're attracting lower quality people. Uh, lower quality, not people, but lower skilled people uh, in their in their industry, uh, because rock stars and experts and people who are great at what they do don't want to be told by someone else how to do what they're already great at. Right. They want the freedom to show their skills. They want the freedom to do their craft, and right. they want to be in an environment that trusts them to do it. And so, if you want to attract world class talent, which I've been fortunate to work with, um, you've got to give them the freedom to be world class in their own way, and trust that. 
that you pick the right person. And if that's on me, right? So if I pick the wrong person, well, that's my decision. But once I make it, you get to do it your way. And I've empowered you to do that as long as our whys are aligned. And obviously you follow our corporate ethos and our culture, which again, that's on me to do up front. That's what I work on. So in interviews, right. I care less about, well, you have 12 years experience versus someone else with 14. Like I don't, it's irrelevant to me. Mm -hmm. and, you know, can you make friends? Can you have fun? Can you be remarkable at everything you do? Are you change ready? And, and do you act with integrity? The answer to those five is yes. Yes. And, and that's what, you, what with the Everbowl, that's what you, you have the five uh, things that you're all in alignment with. Correct? Right. Correct. Because Correct. energy yeah. bleeds. And if you've got somebody from a lower energy, it's going to throw the whole situation off. Right? That's right. Okay. And Perfect. we can both lean. And, and when we step on each other's toes, which is inevitable in any relationship, um, right? There's going to be a time where I need something or they need something. And one of us isn't, you know, it, well, the great thing is we know we're on the same team working towards the same goal. So at the end of the day, no matter how frustrated I might get with someone on my team, if I believe that we're still working towards the same end goal, I know that their intentions are, are, are perfectly aligned with mine. Yes. It's just they see the world differently than I do. And, and that collection of ideas, that, that new set of views and perspective is actually good. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Well, so, okay. How has the pandemic affected your business? It's, uh, it's been interesting. So on uh, March 18th, we had to shut down 28 stores and uh, close them and temporarily lay off 400 people, uh, myself included, laid everyone off. That was, uh, we did that because uh, I believe that there's a stop, drop and roll philosophy when, when you don't know what's going on. And um, a lot of people, you know, it's funny, uh, I'm writing this book with uh, my mentor, Dave Meltzer, and we just did this chapter uh, on- I'm Instagram. having him on my show. I was going to ask you if you knew him yeah. because he was a sports agent. Yeah. So uh, Dave is, uh, Dave and I are writing a book together. He's been a family friend of mine since I was four years old. Uh, he's my first and longest mentor. I've interned and worked with Dave at all of his companies. I was going to be a sports agent with Dave. Uh, no I went to law kidding. School. Yeah, yeah, we're family. We're family. I mean, we've been together 35 years. He's like my brother from another. Our, our moms are best friends. And, and I think it's since I was four years old. On. It's the craziest yeah, so. thing. All these people that I'm picking all know each other. <laughs> okay, right. so go ahead. To the power I was going to ask you about mentorship. What's that? Yeah. It goes to the power of mentorship and working yeah. aligned with, you know, with the same mindset of people. But Dave's an incredible guy. Yeah. And we just did a chapter on this whole concept. But, um, you know, for me, one of my core philosophies is to be change ready. And, and we were talking about it. And um, it's the idea of uncertainty and that, you know, everyone feels like we're in an uncertain world right now. And, and the truth is, it's no more uncertain today than it was a year ago. It's just right we're more hypersensitive to it. Yes. Right. Because yes. pandemic happened. The one thing that no one would have projected or predicted could happen happened and um you know but the the thing is in these situations this is where opportunity really presents itself and those of you out there who are who have the right skills and the right foundation and are prepared to take action during these times of uncertainty or hypersensitive uncertainty um this is where more billionaires and millionaires get made than during regular times and Everbull, we, we were change ready. And, and so we laid everyone off on March 18th. On March 20th, we got into a room. You know, I have a practice that I do. I do a five minute pity party and I set a timer on my phone for five minutes when I'm feeling sorry for myself. And I let myself feel that way for five minutes. The alarm goes off. It's time to get back to swim. I mean, okay. I've had my, my closure, my moment. And, um, you know, we got in the room, me and my couple of my executives. And I said, okay, what are we going to do? And we looked at the business and said, okay, we have 28 retail restaurants that can't open right now. Um, we have all this food that's frozen and we have customers out there who need to be healthy, but don't have access to our food. So what can we do to further our movement and make sure that we're staying in front of customers, building our brand and working towards reopening if and when that's possible. And we launched a product concept called Later Bowls, which is direct to consumer. We started shipping our acai and pitaya bowls directly to people's homes and started an e-commerce website on Shopify the very next day. And then I used uh, my network and started leveraging relationship capital to get on a QVC and was on QVC and was able to sell out in seven minutes and then on again and sold out in eight minutes. And then later bulls really started to grow. And right. um, from there, we had to say it's time to franchise because so many people are losing their jobs as the markets change. And now people have this stay at home economy, but a lot of people couldn't. And so we were getting hit up like, is there franchise opportunity? So we launched franchising in a big way. And we've sold 35 franchises during the pandemic. And uh, we've now reopened uh, 24 of our 28 locations and have rehired almost 300 people back as, the, as we get further away from you know, the height of the pandemic. 
Right. And, and we're thriving. And, you know, I, I, uh, I can say that it's because the team, you know, me and my team, we, we were change ready. We were ready to act and we didn't spend time feeling sorry for ourselves. Or like you said, I, no one's buying homes, but people are selling homes, right? Exactly. No one is, restaurants aren't working, but restaurants are working. They just have to be done differently. We, when we reopened, we didn't reopen the same way. We didn't try to be who we were pre pandemic. We, exactly. It's a new world now. So we opened a concept for all of our stores called store through a door, which is we put a table at the door so no one could come in. And you walk up to the door, we launched an app. So we use technology now. We, we got rid of cash. We made sure we maintained social distancing practices, practices and made sure it was a safe environment for our staff and our, our uh, customers. We launched Everbowl University and rehashed for our staff how to operate the new way with the app and with uh, you know no cash and through a door. So that way our customers wouldn't have to come in. Um, and then how we're able to start to really rebuild what we're doing in this new environment because we have no choice, right? Like we're all in this and we're not going to let external factors dictate whether or not we're successful. But you do have a choice. You can fold up your tent. Not a lot of people do that. So you always, you always have a choice, right? But you, I guess I don't process. It wasn't an option for you, right? Correct. Just was not an option for you. Yeah. No, it's not. So, and, but that all has to do with your mindset because you know, a lot of people just, they do, they are folding up and they tell tell us more about your book. And when is it going to be out? So uh, we don't have, we were supposed to be out already, but the pandemic changed everything, but uh, it's actually a cool, cool concept. So Dave and I are writing this book. Um, it's on the, so unfortunately meant the idea of mentorship is, is so underused today. Um, you should always have a mentor. You should always be a mentor oh. once you get to that point. Um, and you should always have a business coach and you should also be, uh, you should all, everyone out there should have a business coach and speaking to one on, uh, right now, you know, um, I can't stress the importance and, and I use this analogy a lot when I'm talking about it, but um, because I a lot of entrepreneurs are like, well, I just can't afford a coach. And I'm gonna say you can't afford not, or to. not to have a coach. Exactly. Correct. Everybody and you need a coach. mentor and a coach, and one you pay and one you don't. And there's yeah. a very important distinguish distinction between the two because um, you know, Tiger Woods had a swing coach, Michael Jordan had a basketball coach. Even if they're not better at what they do than them, they hold them accountable for that last one or two percent of greatness mm-hmm. that's mm-hmm. inside all of us that we don't give, that yeah. we need a coach to get in there and get out of us. Yeah, right. They're gonna push you to be your absolute best. A mentor is meant to help you steer from 30,000 feet. They're the ones there to keep you on track, to to be your soundboard, to make you emotionally feel good. Your coach Mm -hmm. is there to get that last little bit of results. And so without the exchange of money, if you don't pay somebody to do that, then you're not going to take their their information to heart and vice versa. You're not going to be able to hold them accountable. So I think you need to always pay a coach. And if you can't afford an expensive one, find a cheap one. But, But find someone out there that you can give some money to who is where you want to be who you can learn from, you know, I coach and I'm a mentor. So I, I mentor at the San Diego State's Live and School of Entrepreneurship for free to these college kids. And I love it. I, I get to help them with direction. I'm also an entrepreneur coach for entrepreneurs and I, I charge them and they, you know, I meet with them and I make sure that they are successful. I give them the situational knowledge and the expertise and I expose them to my relationship capital and, and I make sure that they give a hundred percent like you do with your real estate clients. Mm-hmm. And so those two things. So with Dave and being my mentor for 30 years, and he was my business coach for, for a few years and uh, still my mentor. Um, a lot of people don't have the longevity, the, the long game view of that. And because he's been a mentor of mine since I was literally a single digit age human and he was a teenager, I used to go watch him play high school football and he used to babysit me and watch me play Little League. And then I interned at all of his companies and he helped guide me. And I watched him grow and develop as a, as a teenager into law, into college and law school. And, and through all of his entrepreneurship journeys and, you know, making millions of dollars and then losing millions of dollars. And he watched me do the same thing. Uh, we're exposing the value and power of mentorship over a 30 year period oh. and how it's adapted and evolved. And so because we have that long time together, we can really show the mentee mentor view of the same concept right. and how at certain points I didn't understand what he was trying to teach me and I wasn't listening mm-hmm. and I was bullheaded and we, there was times I hated him, right? There was a period of a year and a half where we didn't speak because oh, yeah. he challenged me emotionally in a way that my 23 year old self couldn't deal with. And conversely, when he was going through his shit, I challenged him and he wasn't in a position to, you know, in his early thirties and now him in his fifties and me in my late thirties, here we are. And we're going to be able to uh, share this, these concepts. And so we're, we're about seven chapters out of 10 done. Oh, right um, on. And, and um, yeah, so we'll, we'll be, we'll be done very soon. And, uh, really excited to to launch that and to be able to provide that mentorship insight in, uh, 
insight to, yes. to people out there. Yes, I'm all about that. And then also you've been approached by Forbes to do something for uh, entrepreneurs and also LinkedIn. Tell us about your LinkedIn courses for uh, entrepreneurs. Yep. So uh, two courses for LinkedIn. I filmed them. Uh, the, one of them just went live. It's now available on the LinkedIn library, uh, LinkedIn Learning Library. So if you're a premium member, you have free access. If not, uh, you can buy it. Or if you hit me up, I can give you free access. Um, okay. It's the, the first two topics. One of my courses is Leveraging Relationship Capital, where I really share how I've developed, built and leveraged and developed relationship capital and used it to exponentially grow my businesses over the years. Mm -hmm. And some, some hacks and some tactics that everyone should be deploying. Right away, they're small bite-sized uh, videos that you can implement tomorrow, mm -hmm. um, and you're going to see the power. And it's one of the reasons I've I've been able to be successful in some of my companies is because I've leveraged relationships the way I have, yeah, and utilize them. Um, and then the second one is how to build um, no marketing money, no problem. So how how to basically market your brand without a lot of capital as a startup, and how to get attention and eyeballs and national notoriety on a brand with no money. And it's just some cool things that we've done you know, at Everbowl and with my recruiting agency and my digital marketing company and just how I've done it. Um, again, little bite-sized tactics. That's not live yet on LinkedIn, but it will be very soon. And then uh, for Forbes, yeah, I was recruited to be a instructor for the Forbes School of Business and Technology. They're launching their their KIC, their Knowledge Information Center, where, where entrepreneurs and business owners are going to be teaching these courses. And I'm basically teaching entrepreneurship 101, like how to start a company right. from scratch. You're sitting there today, you don't know what to do, how to which entity to pick, what's a SWOT analysis, how do you actually bet an idea once you have your idea, how to get going, like just the basics because I've done it so many times and um, I think that there's a lot of mental roadblocks and excuses people are making and I want to help them get over them because there's so many great ideas that never see the light of day and it bothers me. It, uh, right. It, well, it's, all, it's, all, it's here. It's all it's here. It's 90%. 90%. Mm -hmm. It's not your circumstances. It's if you can handle this. I mean, do you have, I ask all my guests, this, do you have any certain morning routine, any, you know, to get your yourself mentally ready for the day or, and physically, well, I mean, yeah, to like really yeah, I, get I'm, yourself set up for the day. I, I, my routine is a little different. I mean, I wake up very early. I wake up about 4.30 and, and I get my emails done uh, the first hour and a half of the day. Because I think too often we don't do our emails, we don't attack them because the day gets away from us, or we spend the day doing them. And mm -hmm. there's no reason that you should be writing emails to people at right. two thirty, three o'clock when you could be out selling or growing your brand or meeting new people. That's when that that's the earning time. You know, the emails to me is the time. So I do that first, and then I wake up and I work out and take care of myself physically. So I'm my endorphins are high. You know, you have to. I have to unevolve and make sure I'm healthy and my best self so I can mm -hmm. perform. And then I have breakfast with my daughters and, and then I tackle the day. Okay. So you don't do any like affirmations or journaling or meditation or gratitude or until now, up yeah. until now. Well, <laughs> I, I trust me, this is an area where Dave is, uh, no, he, he, I've been working towards learning how to meditate. I, I have a monkey brain and, um, that's why you it need it. Stops. That's I need why you need it. it. I, I'm just not me good too. at it. And I, and I've yet to be able to, to do it then do it effectively. Uh, Dave's challenged me. Obviously, he's got his 30 days of gratitude, which, you know, of course, is phenomenal. Um, yeah. I highly recommend it. And, and I'm striving to do it. I haven't yet found, I mean, I find my meditation during exercise. Yeah. I'm self reflecting. So maybe I meditate in my own way and I wish I could simply sit and just think. Yeah. Um, well, you know, it's not about thinking, it. it's about being. It's, it's absolutely not about thinking, is what it is. And you know what? Um, I, I like guided meditations. So like when somebody's talking or there's just music, because if it's just silence, because I have, a, I have three different kind of ADDs. So what mm -hmm. I have found, like if, if I'm coaching, I have a little bit of silent and uh, soft music in the background. It helps me um, concentrate. For me, if it's silent, it's my, my mind's like all over the place. So just a suggestion. And then you no, have a podcast a coming out too, right? Yes, I do. Yep. Uh, it's called Unwinding Success. And the idea there is, is um, I'm interviewing successful people, but I don't want to get into as much into their story. Uh, but it's really about who they are and what made them successful. And if we unwind it all, what allowed them to thrive? Because I believe there's a success formula that's pretty constant, like two plus two is four. And if mm -hmm. you interview and if I can show enough successful people in all different areas from athletics to medical field to real estate to biotech or to technology. Yeah. Um, I think there's a common theme between yep. successful people and they figured out this formula. And my goal through the show is going to be to provide the audience with insight into these people. And hopefully they're going to hear one or two or three or four people 
that it starts to click like, oh my gosh, this is the one or two things I'm not doing. Yes. And if I start doing, I'm going to see results and then they're going to do it and get the results. Exactly. And that's the hope. Exactly. That's the hope of the show. Perfect. And when's that going to be available? Have you, is that? Uh... I filmed, uh, yeah, no. So it's all done. Uh, I filmed two episodes. I'm not launching it till I get eight. And yeah. so I have six Good more. Idea. Um, and I'd love to obviously have you on the show. So I'm going to do a little. Oh, good. Right I would love to. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yes, please. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm excited about it. It's, it's a, one of the ways I'm going to be giving back, you know, well, because I think we all get to that point where we want to. We, uh, it, absolutely. You know, you, you get to the point because I was on the other side um, at a certain point in my life. I mean, I read about my first book. I was like really, really insecure, very afraid. You know, I had a father where like, nothing was ever good enough. And so when you come from that and you're coming from a place of lack, it's like if somebody got something, then there's less for me, less of the pie for me. But, you know, you, when, I, when you kind of get to the other side, you know, I started studying metaphysics and I got my master's in metaphysics. And once I started practicing the principles, I started realizing that there's more, more than enough for everybody. And you know what? When you reach success, you want to help other people. You know, it's the people that haven't achieved their dreams that don't want you to achieve their, your dreams. And that's really kind yeah. of the way it works. So good for you, so, paying it forward. Yeah, absolutely. And, 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 and I won't lie. I mean, I think it's a little bit selfish too, because the most, uh, the greatest feeling I've had in the last year is actually there's this kid that I mentor and his success that he's been having, um, writing, I'm just writing I'm just observing. I'm watching his movie and, and being there as a, as a, as a soundboard. And, you know, he's successful without me. I'm just here to give him a little bit of tidbits and give him yeah. some suggestions and ideas and his success. I find myself going home feeling so good when he calls me with these wins that he's getting. Yes. And like, it lifts me up on my day. His yeah. success. Oh yeah. I, I want, I want more of that. That's why I coach, you know, I say, if you're not successful, I'm not successful, you know? And uh, that's where I feel so fulfilled and so rewarded. And, you know, it's all about the, the, you know, my past experience in what I dealt with in my life. People say, why did you become a coach? Is because, you know, I felt so less than, and I know what that feels like. So I have a great deal of empathy and compassion. And, you know, so I've been on all sides of it. I've been, had so many different experiences that I'd like to share and just like to see people like move forward in their life. So, and give them hope back. So, Three takeaways in it for uh, any entrepreneurs that are watching, like if only three, I know there's a lot more okay. that you could do. So just three takeaways for somebody that wants to become an entrepreneur is a little lost, hasn't really found what they want to do yet. Uh, yeah. So the first one, the first one is find yourself a mentor and a coach. I think I already hit on that one, but, um, and, and if you can't find one, reach out to me and I can help introduce you to somebody. It doesn't even, I'm not self promoting myself here. I'm saying, find yourself a mentor, find yourself a coach. Right. That's going to exponentially get you there. Number two, do it now. Um, I think we all have this bad habit of not doing something now. As soon yeah. as it comes, do it. Take the first step because by taking the first step, you will then take the second step, the third step, the fourth step. And the last one is lose the ego. Um, yes. Especially new entrepreneurs, you're going to make mistakes. You don't need to be perfect. You're going to have someone on your team that's going to come up with the best idea your company's ever going to have and run with it. Give them the credit, build them up, build the people around you up and you will pay, it'll pay dividends in your future. Yeah, exactly. One, one thing, one last thing I want to say about ego, because I think when people hear the word ego, they think um, arrogance. Okay. And really mm -hmm. ego is a fragile uh, image of yourself. It really is because people that are very secure don't, have the egos so you know a ego just equates into fear so get move right. beyond the fear feel it and and just just get into action right just get out of your own yes. way stop talking about it get into action the more you can more you do of anything the more you, it's easier to do that so the less you do right same thing that's right that's okay. right and it all compounds so those would be the takeaways but most importantly do it now Awesome. Awesome. Well, so great having you on my show. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. And I can't believe Dave, David's going to be on, I think it's next week or the week after that. So we're going to have That's a conversation awesome. about you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, well thanks for watching. And uh, hopefully I'll have you on again after your book's out. I can, we can talk more about your book and when your podcast is underway. Okay. And, and I'll be having you on hopefully, right? Yes, absolutely. I will be there. Perfect. Thank you All so right, much, everybody. This was thanks, great. Thank you. Thanks for watching and we will see you next week.